friends. Welcome to today's iteration of Tea with Jess. I'm going to be chatting with my friend, Reverend Paul Raybergen today. Paul's an interim pastor currently serving in central New Jersey, which is how I came to know him. We're going to be talking about the nature of transitional ministry and also what transition means in our lives in this moment where so much feels unknown as faithful followers of Christ. So I hope that you'll stay tuned and enjoy this conversation, and I will see you next week. Hello, Paul. Hello, Jess. It's good to see you. Good to be with you. <laughs> it is good to see you as well. Um, welcome to Tea with Jess. This is where I talk to friends about their ministry um, in various and sundry contexts. And so I was hoping that this morning you might tell us a little bit about your current call, what you are currently doing and where you are currently serving, and also how that relates to your larger sense of call. Um, because your current call has sort of predecessors that are interesting. Yes, so, but first let me say, I'm joining you with coffee from your favorite coffee shop. So, My favorite coffee Eddie, shop. Eddie. So I am currently the pastor of the Ewing Covenant Presbyterian Church, which is a church that is now three weeks old. Um, it is the merger of two previous congregations, uh, Ewing Presbyterian Church, which originates back in 1608. Oh my gosh. Uh, the same time that your home church uh, originated, the same, same parent congregation. And um, the Covenant Presbyterian Church, which was a church um, in Trenton, at the very edge of Trenton, that had formed from three previous congregations in Trenton. A part of their history is the white flight of the 50s and 60s um, from the center part of Trenton. Um, and it, it became a part of the history of that congregation and now is part of our history. I am a transitional pastor and have been since the late 80s. Uh, that means that I've intentionally chosen to do ministry to help congregations in transition. Initially, that was in pastoral leadership, um, but was always a little uncomfortable with just that because there is so much happening in the change in a congregation that goes beyond just who the pastor is. Mm -hmm. I'm part of the faculty that teaches transitional ministry for our denomination. I currently teach at Pittsburgh, have taught at Princeton in the past. Um, and th the focus of our work is to talk about leadership in transitional times. So the work that I've been doing in uh, Ewing initially, I came here as a pastor following a major conflict within the congregation um, to work consciously with them for healing um, and uh, then visioning for what their future would be. It was intentionally beyond what a normal interim contract would be because mm. those are kind of limited to a year and a quarter and they're, they're really confined by that understanding that an interim there is to help them find a new pastor. Um, this was going to be way beyond that. About the time we began the visioning process for the Ewing Church, the Covenant Church, um, after a, a number of years of reflection, sold their property and then there began their search for um, what their future was. Um, mm. They eventually ended up rooming in with us um, kind of moving in, and we coexisted as two congregations with one worship service uh, for about a year and a half um, in that process. Then. So part of my leadership in the transitional nature of, of the Ewing Church was to be able to help them adapt to all of those changes um, over the course of the time. Yeah. Um, just knows that I, I was the interim pastor and that was the title at the Pennington Presbyterian Church. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a, a delight to get to know Jess there um, in that time. Yeah. Um, and, but that was, was clearly to work with that church as they transitioned from a long-term pastorate um, to searching through a new one and revisioning who that church was going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the interesting things that happened in that congregational transition was that in their interviewing with the community, they learned that Presbyterian wasn't a problematic title for a church, but church was. Mm -hmm. That at that point, church had such negative implications culturally mm -hmm. that for a period of time, they dropped church from their name and just became Presbyterian. You know, and, and they marketed themselves that way. I've never thought, that, I never knew that 
like, I know that we just called ourselves Pennington Prez for a while, but I had no idea. Right. And even Prez, yeah. what does that mean? Like, it's, if you don't know Presbyterianism, right, then it's just, what is this? It's just a weird acronym for something. But that's, that's fascinating. I had no idea that with, that's yeah. why we did that. And, and they moved, they also um, found a new um, logo for the church, as well as their, their, um, their mission statement, which then informed their search for the new pastor and, and the time since, yeah. since then. So I've been doing that kind of work since 1988 in a succession of, of different kinds of congregations. Um, I, I have always recognized the, the need uh, to look more broadly than just pastor's leadership to understand the dynamics of change within mm-hmm. the congregation. Yeah. Um, and in the teaching we do at, at, at the Pittsburgh site, uh, we really focus on the context, uh, the community in which the church exists and what's changing in there that impacts uh, the changes within the congregation. Yeah. And so how many churches have you helped transition at this point in your career, Paul? Um, 14 intentionally. You would add two, if well, three, if you went before that, because I started as a youth pastor for three years and then worked with two yoked congregations in rural New York for 10 years um, and, and the transitions in those communities and, and thus in the churches were, were significant. Mm-hmm. And can you explain what yoked means? Just because not everybody knows it's kind of a churchy term. Well, it's actually a rural farming term. You used to yoke the oxen together so that they would pull evenly. Um, in church language, it means two pastors, or two churches that share one pastor. Um, they maintain their separate identity. Um, the only thing that really brings them together is the, the pastor and whatever ministry they develop with that pastor together. So what on God's green earth made you want to do transitional ministry? What, what you're describing has a lot to do with reflecting on identity, um, which for a lot of institutions is a really uncomfortable and conflictive process. Uh, and so it's really interesting to meet someone who feels called to lean into that conflict since we live in a society that's mostly conflict averse. So. What made you think this is what I want to do to serve the church um, and God? So it's a sequence of events that led me into it. Um, I am the spouse of another ordained Presbyterian minister, Mary Ann Raybergen, who was called to become um, a, uh, an associate executive for Chicago Presbytery. So we moved from New York State to Chicago for, for five years and for her work there. And I began... Um, we, we began with a reversal of roles that I was to be the stay, stay at home parent and take care of the kids. And um, we quickly learned that we could financially not afford that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I then began to look for part time work and became um, uh, initially a part time pastor for um, uh, member care at a, a larger church and then um, was taken on as their interim associate pastor for um, for the congregation for pastoral care. We then moved back east, and I went through the normal process of searching for a call and, and um, was among the finalists in about three different churches, um, and each time met the question of how do we know you'll stay? Because that was in the era when the perception was that successful pastors stay for a long time forever. in the church. Forever. 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 Well, almost forever. Um, so all I could answer to that question was, well, it's my turn. Uh, we're moving for my purpose at this point. Or, and then really the developmental answer of that was, um, I am with you as long as you and I feel called to serve one another for the Lord. Um, that wasn't a good enough answer. Um, then a, an interim position became available that I was hired for and began that very intentional work of, of helping that church um, re-understand its, its purpose in ministry and call a new pastor. Um, and when that ended, another one came and another one came. So part of my understanding is that the Lord opens doors for us to enter. 
And when we are willing to do those, take those steps, then our, our ministry really gets defined for us. Mm -hmm. I found that the gifts that I have for listening, for making uh, quick connections with people, for um, seeing the broader systems of a congregation um, are very useful in helping congregations in transition. And then I became aware that with all the change that's happening in the world, that there is no settled ministry anymore, if there ever was. And the old model of interim work of settled pastorate to unsettled time to the next settled pastor was a fallacy and it just didn't exist. Yeah. And so how do we work with churches to help them recognize that the one constant in God's world besides God is God's change? Mm. Um, and how do we then look at, at we, the leadership in a church um, to make that happen? And how do we understand the spirit at work within a congregation yeah. to go along with that? Um, God may be infallible, but that doesn't mean that God is static. And so I, right. I think that's really helpful for a lot of people to remember, especially in this moment. Um, and that kind of takes me to my next question, which is a lot of us are uncomfortable right now because we're in a moment where so many things are transitioning that we did not consent to allow to transition. Um, this is a really disempowering moment for a lot of people in congregations. This is a, this is a moment where a lot of people aren't being able to meet in their buildings and experience church in the traditional ways. And so I'm just kind of wondering what advice, as someone who's been in transitional ministry now for almost 40 years, what can you offer churches and congregants and a nation that's in this weird state of flux that's causing so much anxiety and discomfort. Well, I'd note one thing right off in your question um, is a notion that we in some way control mm -hmm. and we don't. Um, and one of the realizations for me early on in ministry was that the changes that are happening around the congregation impact the congregation. And so often we hide from that reality and that brings the result that the congregation is no longer able to connect uh, to the people around them. Um, and so they lose their sense of being able to be in ministry to the community. Presbyterian churches historically were named about by the community in which they existed. And it, that implies that the church is going to connect with that community mm -hmm. to be in ministry. But with the changes that happen in a community, when, if the church is not able to move along with that, it's, uh, it loses purpose in the name, let alone the reality of ministry ends. The other thing I would note is that this COVID-19 experience is really um, pushing us to make, to understand the change that has always been happening. We've tried to respond to that change with strategic responses. You know, if we do a better program, if we just get a better preacher, if we do this, if we do that, then that will bring us back to what was. This is causing us to really understand that we're being called into something different. Mm -hmm. That the focus we've had on our buildings and the focus on bringing people into the building is blown out of the water by all of this. Yep. How do we do ministry in a time when, when we're not able to gather people in and yet ministry still needs to be done. How do we do ministry using new techniques that um, make a, or allow us to be in contact with people? So the conscious reflection that our future is different than our past. Mm -hmm. We are not the people in exile who are gonna to return to the promised land. We want our meat pots. <laughs> Wait, we, we are the people, you know, in the wilderness headed to the new promised land and and those are important biblical images for us and if you want an image for what the early you know for what the church is going to become go to the book of acts and and realize that there was nothing to return to there therefore people were able to find new things and and the the you know the power of those statements early in acts of of the 
um, conversion of people by their experience of how the church cared, for, the people of the church cared for, cared for each other, led them to become a part of that. So how do we care for each other today? You know, and, and how do we preach a good news in, in a, a troubled time? Um, how, do we, how do we share the good news of God's presence when we can't be present with one another in the same way? God is causing us to reflect on that and to think that through and, and to be more honest in our response to, to our faith. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned, I really appreciate you mentioning Exodus and also Acts as these two sort of biblical models um, and testaments to the fact that this is something God's people have gone through before. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sort of wondering too, uh, if there are any, what have you seen in terms of the churches you've served? What are sort of the top three attributes that you've seen churches cultivate that's made transition, I don't know if easier is the right word, but more, it's, it's made the soil for the transition more fruitful, I guess. You're going back to your sower and the seed. I so, really am. I just, I can't get away from my agrarian <laughs> metaphors. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> well, one of the things is hospitality. Okay. The, the ability to create a welcoming space. The ability to create a welcoming sense for anybody who enters um, your world. Um, and, and that takes a step away from what has traditionally been a sense of orthodoxy, for instance, and purity of thought, and, and welcomes, the, um, welcomes the ideas of the person as well as the presence of the person. Mm -hmm. It's the step beyond, oh, we're a friendly church, we welcome everybody. Yeah, but do we accommodate? And, and do we, do we, are we at all changed by those we encounter? You know, and part of, part of my growth in ministry was, was to learn about systems theory and family systems and what the impact of an individual who functions as themselves and identifies as themselves, the impact that person has on changing the system. So when we as a church encounter someone new, how open are we to being impacted by them? Because the only way a system changes is by that openness to the person who's, who's self-identifying and, and functioning as themselves. Yeah. I, I think one of the incredibly interesting pieces around the current uh, justice movements that have come out of the, the death of, of, of Floyd, Floyd is, yeah. is, the, is the leadership of young adults. It, it's not an established civil rights uh, um, leadership that's, that's leading these. It's young people. And um, the willingness of the community, the established rights leaders, to step aside and let these people, people express and lead. Yeah, there's all kinds of things that can be worked out over time and things like that. But that's an example of a system changing uh, because of the impact of new folk coming into it mm -hmm. and the willingness to create space for them to be present. Mm -hmm. That's, I think that's wonderful. And that, I think, you know, institutions are terrified of change. And it's interesting to frame that in terms of hospitality, because you're right really good hospitality, authentic hospitality um, invites relationship and relationship leads to, you know, a softening of our dogmatic ideals. Um, and so I think that's good. And so, so the, the biblical model for me in that again comes from Acts and Peter and Cornelius. And, and you know, the, the, the vision of Peter that Peter has, the vision that Cornelius has coming together to bring a new understanding for how people are to be together. And that, that whole movement from the followers of Jesus identifying as you know, Jews to the, four, you know, the movement into uh, the breadth of the world and the welcoming of our faith to any and all. Yeah. And, and that speaks volumes. And, and it's interesting that 
um, from the first interim position I did, the first transitional position I did, the biblical study we did as part of the congregational self-study focused on those early passages in Acts that speak about what those churches did, mm -hmm. and then uh, 1 Corinthians 12. People love 1 Corinthians 13, but 1 Corinthians 12 establishes the, the meaning of 1 Corinthians 13. Mm -hmm. And, and the discussion of the body of Christ and all of the parts being equally important. The statement that when one suffers, all suffer. When one celebrates, all celebrate. So as long as there's one faction, one element that suffers, how can we celebrate? Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, it's, it's, it becomes an issue of hospitality. How do, we, how do we welcome those who suffer in garments too? Especially in a, in a societal context where we like celebrating, mm -hmm. but we don't ever want to suffer, even, yeah. even as Christians who have been invited into that. I think that's really interesting. But so that's the first thing is hospitality. What, what are some other attributes you recommend for weathering change well, weathering transition well? It's uh, perception of creation. Okay. Is, is creation done or is the creator still creating? And are we part of that creation? And, and if, if so, you know, what does that mean for how we live? Um, do we live statically or do we live in, in ways that are for open and, and adaptive to change? Mm -hmm. And, and um, I would use the word adaptive rather than responsive. Mm. Because when we respond to something that doesn't require us to change. But when we adapt to something, a change, it, that requires something to be different in ourselves. Um, and I, I have come to believe that we're created to be adaptive, not just responsive. Yeah. I would say observant adaptive as well. So, okay. or anticipatorily <laughs> adaptive is I think the healthiest, just I think of things like my own work with climate change. Um, and seeing what's coming down the pike uh, and adapting beforehand so that when it comes, I have a little bit more of a mental acuity to handle it, you know? So you bring out the willingness to see mm -hmm. um, and the willingness to um, accept differing understandings than your own and have them impact your own understanding. When, when we were at, um, at Pennington, um, the, the adult ed program wanted a different kind of study than the traditional bringing a, a guest speaker who speaks or a traditional Bible study that focused on. So what, we, what was developed then was, um, I, I'm trying to remember what the title of it was, but um, six people gathered, did a reflection on a, a systemic, systematic theology book, and then uh, developed a course in which no pastor was leader, mm -hmm. and everybody took a turn, and it was focused around the questions of faith people had. Mm -hmm. And they posted all the questions that they could come up with around the walls, and then from week to week would deal with a different question, with a different person each week doing the preparation for that presenting an answer to that and then the willingness of people to say, yeah, but this is how I understand it. This is what I was taught. And out of that interaction of ideas came um, new understandings of, of tr traditional, you know, orthodox practices and understandings within the church. It was a, an incredibly creative group. Mm -hmm. And the best part of it was I didn't have to do any preparation for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And making faith real was the yes. name of that class. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and, and I think that's instructive too for this moment in terms of a lot of us don't necessarily have to confront what we believe until that's called into question yes. um, because it's so sort of innate within us that we don't reflect on it because we don't think to. So I think, right. yeah. And so I don't know if that's your third thing or if that's a third thing I imposed on the conversation. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's the hospitality, it's the willingness to engage your, your ideas and understandings. Um, yeah, it, it's all of that. Okay, cool.
So my, I also like to ask everybody who's in these conversations with me, what is bringing you joy and hope in this moment? Um, these are times where a lot's going on. And so I think that having all the feedback we can about where different people are and what their practices are and what they're seeing that's really moving them towards God is a really important thing to reflect on. Um, one of the things that has brought me the most joy where I'm working right now, um, and, and it, it really pre-exists, but the existence of it means so much in this particular time. Um, because of the changing dynamics of the congregation and then the, the coming together of the two churches, there was a real concern among the leadership um, about those who had been distanced from the congregation during the conflict and how to be in touch with them, uh, to care for them and reach them. And as the congre this is an older congregation, and as people became less able to be present, how, how would we stay in touch with them? So the, um, an elder and a deacon met with, with me and we began to talk about how do we create a comprehensive umbrella structure for the care of the church? It goes beyond the responsibilities of the elders, responsibilities of the deacons, and really works to do two things, connect to everybody and empower people to be in ministry. Mm -hmm. And they developed a care team ministry uh, that has five, five focal points, um, visitation, meals, uh, information on social services, um, uh, relief for um, uh, significant caregivers, um, hot, uh, respite care. Mm -hmm. um, and um, rides. Oh, yeah. Rides for, yeah. Um, and they developed a structure for that and then began by not looking to see who needed it, but by talking about, we want to develop this ministry, who would like to be part of it? Mm -hmm. And people were able to then sign on, volunteer, for one, any one or more of those areas of ministry. Um, contact, you know, leaders were, were identified, contact information was shared, training was done for those in, in the particular in the areas of visitation, respite care, and, and others. Um, and it was launched. Mm -hmm. And then a second part of it was also developed, which, which is a, um, a parish leaders. And so our elders and deacons are teamed together and given responsibility for regular contact with a set group of, of people within the congregation. Um, and initially, not surprisingly in many ways, there were more people willing and volunteering to help than there were people asking for the assistance. Um, and, and that comes out of our Northeastern uh, understanding uh, or, or prejudice against asking for help, mm -hmm. um, which slowly uh, has been overcome. Yeah. But what it really did is it established, one, the idea that every member of the church can be involved in the calling and care ministries of the church, not just the pastors. Mm -hmm. It empowered people to do that by helping them learn how to, how to do it, including learn how to pray with someone um, and, and setting that le loose within the life of the congregation. And slowly the success, the empowerment of that ministry happened. Um, and um, then COVID-19 hits. And a congregation that can no longer gather to do the, the care that happens within a congregation whenever we gather. Mm -hmm. There was a structure and a system already, already mm -hmm. in place to reach beyond that tradition. Yeah. So that, that's one of the neatest things that's, that's happened here. Yeah. And, and again, it is um, a piece that's really driven by the members of the church, not by the pastoral staff. Yeah, that sounds pretty joyful and hope giving right now yeah. in terms of just empowering people to do the work. Yeah, um, that's awesome. And yeah, that's, that's really great, Paul. I'm really happy to hear that that got established beforehand and that the seeds of that are continuing to, to yeah. fruit now. That's awesome. Um, well, before we kind of wrap up here, are there any more truth nuggets you have to share about ministry or life in COVID-19 or life in this particular moment we find ourselves in as a society? Um, I, I think it, it's understanding how Jesus functioned. 
um, that his ministry was an itinerant ministry. Um, it wasn't set in any particular places, but it did have a direction. Mm -hmm. um, and the direction was um, to be the embodiment uh, of the kingdom of God that is drawn near. Sometimes we forget that piece of it, that we are called to be the embodiment of the kingdom that is present already. And in particular times like this, it's really hard to see that kingdom present, which means all the more that we need to be that kingdom present. Mm -hmm. that so? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Paul. This has been as always, a wonderful and rich conversation. Um, and I would love to invite you to kind of pray us out. So if you wouldn't okay. mind, I'd love that. All right, let's pray. Gracious and loving God, you are present with us in so many ways and so many times, so many purposes. We thank you for your presence in this conversation and for the wisdom that you bring to all of your people, which means all people. Mm -hmm. Guide us as we seek to live out our faith, your love, in this time, in this place, in these circumstances. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Paul. You're we'll welcome. See you later. Have see a good afternoon. Later. Bye. Yep.